Hello everyone, this is Mr. Davidson, and in this video we're going to be discussing the very, very beginning of Chapter 1. Or basically, it's a, going to be a very brief introduction into matter and energy. And so these topics are going to be reintroduced and rediscovered and reevaluated over the entire course of the semester. And so a very brief introduction is kind of necessary just to kind of make sure that everybody's on the same page. Most of these concepts shouldn't be brand new to you, but maybe it's been a while since you've kind of discussed them or heard about them. And so the very first thing we're going to talk about is, again, hopefully not brand new to you, but the states of matter. And so in chemistry, we generally talk about the three states of matter as solid, liquid, and gas. And so just because you've heard these phrases, I just want to make sure that you actually understand what they mean in terms of the atoms and how they're actually kind of situated inside these complexes. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is a solid. And so as you can kind of see from this illustration here, a solid is going to have a very arranged atom structure. And so we actually refer to these things as a condensed state of matter. And so condensed just means that every single one of these atoms inside of this structure here are going to be touching every other atom that are next to it and surrounding it in and out of the plane, everywhere that you look, there's going to be an atom touching another atom. And so this is what gives a uh, solid a fixed shape and a fixed volume. These atoms are already smushed as close to each other as possible, so there's no possible way to kind of push them any closer to each other. And because they're in fixed positions where they at, jiggling in place, but again, very solid structure, then normally you're going to have a fixed volume as well. Because again, you can't make something move if it's already in a fixed position. And so we're all familiar with solid water referred to as ice. Ice is a solid at cold temperatures, and it's kind of more on the harder side than maybe liquid water. And so liquid water, one thing I do need to point out because it's you very, very easily overlooked, but water is, or sorry, liquid is also considered a condensed state of matter. So please note it is not nearly as condensed as a solid. Not all the atoms are going to be in their fixed positions but it is still a condensed uh, state of matter considering the fact that all of these atoms are touching other atoms. The main difference between a solid structure and a liquid structure is the fact that atoms in liquid structures are able to move around. They're not stuck in their fixed positions. And so in liquids, you actually have atoms that are kind of able to move up and over and under and around all the other atoms. And so in this case, this is why you can have varying shapes when it comes to the liquids. And so you can take a gallon of milk and you can pour it into a cup-sized container and it actually takes the shape of the cup. It doesn't stay the same shape as the gallon it came out of. But on the other side of that, you cannot smush these atoms any closer to each other as possible. I'm sorry, any more like together because they're as close to each other as possible. And so this is where the condensed state comes into play. And so in this situation, if you have a gallon of milk you can't pour the whole entire gallon into a cup-sized container because it's just not going to fit. You can't smush these atoms any closer to make them any smaller of a volume. And so the last thing we're going to talk about is whenever we have our liquid water convert into gas. And so I'm not going to really talk about gases too, too much right now, mainly because there is a whole chapter devoted to them later on in the semester. But basically, gases don't have any rules that kind of guide them. All they really do is bounce around until they run out of energy. Then they get some more energy from heat or sun or anything else that has energy associated with it. And then they bounce around some more. There is no fixed volume. There is no fixed shape, mainly because they're just a bunch of free atoms. And please notice here, this is the only state of matter that's on this slide that is not considered a condensed state. And the reason why is because all these atoms have a lot of space around them. They're actually bouncing all around. If you've never seen a gas come out of a canister before, you notice that the gas does not just stay in place. It keeps expanding and expanding and expanding until you can't really see the gas anymore. And so the next topic we need to talk about is going to be physical properties and changes. And so a physical property is something that a, a compound shows without it interacting with anything else. And so if you look outside and you see a red car, then it's a red car. It does nothing really happen to change that car into a red car. And so color, melting point, boiling point, freezing point. I mean, you also have a couple other things like densities. These things are all going to be considered physical properties because nothing really has to happen to those compounds or that substance 
in order for that property to be like shown. And so a physical change just changes the way it looks. It changes the heat. It changes, uh, again, the way that it's wet or if it's dry. But physical changes do not change anything about that actual chemical structure. And so example of this is whenever you have solid water versus liquid water. And so in those, both of those cases, ice versus liquid water, you're both or both of them still have composition of H2O. Going from a solid to a liquid to a gas is a physical change because nothing is happening to that water except the positions of those waters relative to one another. So another example again is if you have a huge rock and say you break that rock. In this case, you're just breaking a rock. You're not doing anything to the chemical composition. You just have one rock, you break it, now you have two rocks. You're not going to just hit that rock and it spontaneously change into a gold nugget or anything. Now, the last example that I have here is, as I mentioned earlier, changing a color of something. And so if you have a red car and you go and get it at a body shop and they change it to a green car, they didn't change that car into a puppy. It's still a car. And so in these cases, these few examples, every example I've shown has absolutely nothing changed about that chemical structure chemical composition is going to remain the same when you're talking about physical changes. On the other end of that spectrum, we have chemical properties and changes. And so a chemical property is only going to be shown whenever you have some type of interaction between your substance and something else. And most of the time we refer to these as chemical reactions. And so if you have something like a piece of wood and you catch it on fire, you have a chemical composition being changed. And so in this example here, I have a chemical change from an iron nail into an iron oxide kind of coating on the nail, and we refer to that as rust. And so if you kind of take a look at the two structures here, you have your iron atoms, and they're all nice aligned and a nice pretty structure. All of them are iron. But as soon as iron gets into contact with the like, excess amount of oxygen, it spontaneously wrecks about the oxygen. And you're all familiar with this if you lived in Texas during our 98% humidity days. If you have a nice brand new bicycle and the chains are all nice and shiny, the next day you come out outside, I mean, you're going to have some nasty red orangish crud on there, mainly because there's oxygen in the air, there's oxygen in water, if there's oxygen everywhere surrounding that iron, it's going to interact and you create what they call iron oxide. In this case, now you have iron atoms and mixture of oxygen atoms in this new structure here. And so please note, that doesn't look anything like that. There is a chemical change. There's a change in the composition of the atoms. There is a rearrangement of atoms. If there's an introduction of new atoms, basically if what you started off with does not look anything like what you end up with, you went through a chemical change. I mentioned earlier fire. This is a great example, mainly because wood and what you end up with as carbon at the end, or ash, they are made of completely different substances. Wood has a bunch of carbons and hydrogens and oxygens. It has some dirt. It has a bunch of other random stuff in there. But at the end, once you set it on fire, you're left with a pile of ash. And so in this case, that ash does not resemble a tree. Another huge indication that you're looking at a chemical change is chemical changes do not really reverse very easily. What I mean by that is if you have a unlit match and you strike that match and it catches on fire, no matter how hard you try, sticking that thing in the freezer is not going to change that unlit or that lit match back into an unlit match. So therefore, you're looking at a chemical change. You can't take a piece of wood, set it on fire, and then take that ash and make it back into a piece of wood. Not without some other skills I don't have. And the last example I have is acids. And so acids are very good at chewing things up and, well, quote unquote, melting them. But in this case, you cannot take that sponge and just kind of put it like underneath some water and make it into a brand new sponge. So corrosiveness is another chemical reaction that occurs. And so now that I've kind of introduced the matter portion of this uh, rest of the semester, let's take a quick look at the energy side here. And so a very brief definition of what energy is is energy is the capacity to do work. And what I mean by the capacity to do work is if you're like Stewie here and you drink a lot of Mountain Dew, you have a lot of energy. You have a lot of ability to do the work, but unless you actually go outside and go mow the lawn or go outside and again, push some rocks around, 
no work is being done. And so energy and work sometimes are kind of used uh, interchangeably, but basically they have to be working together. You need to have energy to do work. If you don't have energy, you don't do the work. But on the other side of that, just because you have energy does not mean you are doing work. If you sit at home all summer and if you drink monsters all day long, yeah, you have the energy, but as long as you're sitting there playing like the or playing your video games all day long, you're not going to get much done. And so you actually have to get up and use that energy to do work. And by work, I mean some type of interaction that involves a force through some type of distance. And so if you get up after you drink all your monsters and you start randomly pushing boxes around, don't know why you would, but hey... But if you start pushing boxes around, then again, you're actually using that energy to do work. You're applying some force through your push, through some distance, and again, just moving from one spot to another, you're changing the distance. For example, if you go outside and you try to take your dog for a walk, or if your dog takes you for a walk, in these cases, you are putting some force over some type of distance. And so in every one of these cases, energy is just the capacity to do something doesn't mean you're actually doing something. But once you actually have some type of change in your distance through some type of force, now work is being done. And so in terms of energy, there are going to be two definitions of energy that you need to have memorized from the get-go. And so the first type of energy is what we call potential energy. And so potential energy, you will hear it repeatedly, has to do with position. And so on the other kind of side note of that also has to do with composition. And so potential energy starts with a PO. Position starts with a PO. That's the easiest way you can kind of go about that. And so by potential energy, I mean the position at where you are or where you're going to be. And so a great example of this is if you take a heavy, heavy rock and you place it above your head. And again, knowing at least the very minimal concepts of gravity you probably understand that if you let go of that rock, you better move out of the way. Because the idea here is that rock wants to be on the ground. Gravity says, sit on the ground, and rock says, okay. But as soon as you lift that rock off of the ground, you are inputting some type of potential energy because you are moving that position of the rock to a place it doesn't want to be. And so as soon as you let go of that rock, something's going to happen. And so what I mean by composition is if you have a stick of dynamite, and so hopefully you're smarter than this, but don't hold a stick of dynamite next to a flame unless you know what you're doing. And so that stick of dynamite without a flame next to it has the potential to blow your hand off. But hopefully you understand, do not do that. And so on the other side of the type of energies, we have what they call kinetic energy. And so kinetic energy is the energy to do in, or, sorry, through some motion. And so if potential energy has to do with position, sitting still, then kinetic energy has to do with you moving around. And so in this case, once you have that rock above your head and you let go of that rock and hopefully you move out of the way, then again, that position is going to be changed because that rock is going to come flying down to the ground. And so you are converting that potential energy of that rock being someplace it doesn't want to be into kinetic energy to do work. And so a good example of the kinetic energy is if you are, again, going to light that dynamite and then run far, far away before it explodes, that potential energy of that piece of dynamite is going to change into kinetic energy whenever the explosion occurs and you feel the force and you feel the heat and everything else that kind of comes around it. And so the whole idea here is potential energy and kinetic energy are always going to be like a go hand in hand. You always have to have some type of interchange between potential energy and kinetic energy for work to be done. And so in order to kind of explain that a little bit better here, <clears throat> lower energy states are more stable. What I mean by that is the rock sitting on the ground wants to be on the ground. As soon as you lift it off the ground, you are in, inputting some energy. That energy doesn't want to be there. That rock wants to have the lowest energy as possible. So as soon as you let go of that rock, it's going to go lower energy and fall right down to the ground where it's nice and stable and happy. And so this can all be kind of summed up in something we're going to discuss a little bit more in the later chapters, but it's called conservation of energy. And so the 
total amount of energy in the entire universe, all known galaxies, ever since the Big Bang, all the way until the end of the universe, way after we're gone, must remain constant. Meaning the fact that you cannot change the amount of energy in the universe. The energy can be conserved and it can be changed from one form to another to another to another. But you cannot create it nor destroy it. It has to remain constant. So, one thing I have to make perfectly clear here is the total amount of energy must remain constant. Not the potential energy and not the kinetic energy. And so the total amount of energy or the sum of the potential energy and kinetic energy must remain constant. And so if we have a change in potential energy, the kinetic energy must change as well in order to kind of counteract that difference. And so one thing in, or like might help you kind of understand this a little better is if you're on a roller coaster. I'm sorry if you don't like roller coasters. I love them. But if you're on a roller coaster and the potential energy remains constant, that means your potent or your position remains constant. That means you're just sitting in the roller coaster cart in the front and all the people in the line are staring at you and nothing is happening. And so if your potential energy remains constant, that means you never stop move or sorry, never start moving. It means you're always going to be stuck in that one spot. Therefore, on the other end of that, if your kinetic energy remains constant, then that means that you are always moving. And so I Granted, I love roller coasters. That third loop-de-loop -loop might seem fun, but after the 30th loop-de-loop, -loop, then again, you're probably going to want to get off the roller coaster as soon as possible. And so the whole idea here is if your potential energy increases, your kinetic energy must decrease. If your kinetic energy increases, then your potential energy must decrease. And so whenever this change occurs, whenever you have a change of potential energy to kinetic or vice versa, this is when work is being done. So one more time, just so I hopefully I get my point across before I end this video. The sum of the potential energy and kinetic energy must remain constant. Not just the potential and not just the kinetic energy. That would either be a very boring world or a very hectic, never-ending stock world. That's all I got for this video and hopefully you check out my other ones coming up soon.